Assalamu alaikum everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, alhamdulillah. So inshallah, today we'll talk about a Muslim's approach to preventive health. Just a brief introduction about myself. My name is Ilham Malik. I have a master's in dietetics from the US and India. I'm a certified health coach and I have a ijazah in hadith studies. My aim, to, uh, inshallah, is to combine the wisdom of prophetic nutrition and modern nutrition and to bring you the best of both worlds and um, the best of both knowledge, inshallah, so that we can take care of our health in the best way possible. So today we'll talk about um, the importance of health in Islam, uh, the different body types, uh, what does it mean to eat according to your body type, the temperament of different foods, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the gut flora and how to nourish that as well, inshallah. So subhanAllah, we know that our body is a miracle that was given by our, um, you know, the most gracious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our body contains more than 37 trillion cells, the heart beats almost 35 million times a year, and the kidney filters over 142 liters of blood every day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, in Surah Taqasur, verse 8, that on the day of judgment, you shall be asked about the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to know that we have a duty to take care of our health. And how we do that is by doing our best in eating as healthy as we can and taking care of our body. In Surah Baqarah in verse 172, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O believers, eat from the good things we have provided for you and give thanks to Allah if you truly worship Him alone. So we need to remember this, that when we eat, we are changing our health. Every bite and every thought we have does change our DNA and our genetic makeup. The genes that we are born with may be the seed, but the environment is the watering can. Our food, our lifestyle, our mental state, everything affects our health, subhanAllah. And we are really blessed that we as Muslims have been given guidelines to and rules for everything from marriage to prayer to eating to dressing. And we have, you know, we were blessed that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a was born a man, a human being, and he showed us how we should be eating and how and what we should be eating as well. Allah in Surah Al-Azab says in verse 21, there has certainly be f been for you in the Messenger of Allah an excellent pattern for, or an example for anyone whose hope is in Allah and the last day and who remembers Allah often. And in Surah Najm, verse two to four, Allah says, your fellow man is neither misguided nor astray, nor does he speak of his own whims. It is only a revelation sent down to him, subhanAllah. How blessed are we that we have been given the perfect prophet and the perfect example to follow. In today's world, we see there's so much misinformation, there's so much confusion, there's, you know, you just type on Google, you go on Instagram, you go on Facebook, and there's so much, you know, talk and chatter that, you know, we don't know what to follow, what to eat. But subhanAllah, if we just go back to our Prophet, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was, you know, what was his sunnah, what is said in the Quran, inshallah, we'll have a clear guideline as to what to eat and how to eat. So going a little bit into the Islamic medicine now, uh, we know that this, the Islamic medicine took the best from all the different ancient uh, traditional uh, medicine, that is the Greek medicine, the traditional Chinese medicine, the Ayurvedic medicine, and the Persian medicine. And Islamic physicians like Ibn Sina and Arazi adopted the four constitution from the works of Hippocrates. And it is also important to note that the doctor of our Prophet wasallam was Al-Harith Ibn Qalada, Rahimullah, and he was a companion and the oldest known Arab physician who was also educated and practiced the Greek medicine or Unani tip. And so we see that the Islamic medicine is a combination of the, uh, of the Sunnah, that is the prophetic medicine, and then it also took the best of the practices from Ayurveda, the traditional Chinese medicine, the Greek and the Persian. And with this, we have the different branches, right? We have the herbs that we that uh, our Prophet Sallallahu spoke about, uh, such as uh, the black seed, the senna, and then we have the dietary practices about how he uh, you know, recommended that we eat uh, the honey 
and olive oil, and then we have mind and body therapy, the spiritual healing, which is Ruqya, which, you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, we are so concerned about, you know, the modern um, medical medical practices that we forget to do Ruqya, right? So inshallah, we should make a, you know, we should make effort that when we are afflicted, you know, whether it is you know, not only with evil eye, that's what we usually go for Rukia towards, right? But even for any uh, physical ailment that we always turn towards that, and as well, as well as applied therapy, that is the modern medicine. You know, subhanAllah, Allah has given us, you know, so much information and so much advancement. So obviously we cannot, you know, ignore that or turn our back on it. But inshallah, what we need to believe is that it's a combination of everything, right? And Islamic medicine, as we know, was during its time was more advanced than the European med medicine in medieval times. And this, and there, there were two reasons. One was medical le learning was promoted in Islam, as the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that for every disease, Allah has given a cure. And as a result, the caliphs supported the development of medical knowledge and understanding. And they helped in many different ways. Baghdad, for example, was a key location where medical manuscripts were translated from Greek into Arabic under the rule of Caliph Harun al-Rashid. And, um, you know, we had the Islamic hospitals called the Maristans, which is from, you know, where the uh, MCC uh, took its, uh, you know, the, the mental health um, uh, the clinics that they are opening and unlike the christian hospital that was focused on caring for patients the muslim hospitals were focused on treating patients so you can see that you know subhanallah we have always had a very rich history of you know treatment and um, you know uh, treating any illness rather than just you know sitting back and taking a you know laid back attitude and even the book the healing with the Prof medicine of the prophet by imam um, ibn al-qayyim rahimullah we see that you know the minute we dive into it the four constitutions are just given very naturally it is assumed that the reader knows this and at that point of time this this was common knowledge but subhanallah as modern nutri medicine took hold you know this uh, the the four humors were kind of pushed back into the, uh, the background, right? Here, what happened, the human body was considered to be different from, like, you know, as a different compartments, right? So we have the cardiology, we have the, uh, you know, the gastric department, we have different departments. But the if you see any, um, you know, traditional medicine, it was always, uh, you know, the body was taken as a whole, and then the the constitution of body was given a lot of importance. So today we'll just go ahead and learn a little bit about the four temperaments or the four humors in regards to your health and how we can eat according to that, inshallah. So these personality types were defined by Plato, Aristotle, and Galen in the second century AD. And these are based on the four elements of fire, earth, water, and air. And then these were incorporated into medical theories by the Greek physician Hippocrates. And even recently now, whenever you do personality tests, like the Maya Briggs test and everything, this is what it is always based on. And I'm sure a lot of you all have already heard this. We had uh, Ustada Hosai as well talk about this earlier in regards to your personality. So today I'll connect this in regards to your food and uh, you know how it affects our health as well. So the first thing is what are these four temperaments? So these four temperaments are based on the four humors or the fluids in the body and uh, the blood is connected to sanguine, the black bile is melancholic, Phlegm is phlegmatic and the yellow bile is choleric. So what this means is that we as human beings, we have one of this dominating our uh, health and our personality, but all of them exist, right? And uh, we want to be, you know, we want to make sure that these all are in balance. And it is when there is, you know, an imbalance, that is when you see some health issues coming up. So uh, many of you all know, you know, you all have, must have taken personality tests and everything, but the food, the, the health the food, the you know, the temperaments regarding to health are not exactly connected. They may, they might be an overlap, but for example, if you are, you know, like melancholic in your personality, doesn't necessarily mean that you're melancholic in your health as well. You could be something else because they, there's not, you know, like it's not the same, but there, it, there could be an overlap, inshallah. 
So how do we know that this is from the Sunnah? So there are two ways, right? The, the one of the uh, most common hadith that we always uh, you know, hear about, especially in Ramadan, is Abdullah ibn Ja'far reported that I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam eating fresh dates with cucumbers, right? And uh, Aisha radiallahu anha has also said that the Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to eat melon with fresh dates and then said, we remove the heat of this one, that is the dates, with the coolness of this, that is the water melon right so we know that there is a temperament in foods that a lot of you know traditional um you know medicine and uh you know like for ayurveda uh, they always talk about but again modern nutrition doesn't believe but inshallah if we you know go back and we think about it you'll see that there is a lot of wisdom in this and it is you know and we obviously have the proof from this hadith as well and uh, about the body energetics, this was again mentioned in uh, the hadith by Um Al Munzir, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam entered upon me while Ali radiallahu anhu was with him, and we had a cluster of unripe dates hanging. She said that the so Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam began eating, and Ali radiallahu anhu ate with him. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Stop, for you are still recovering." So Ali sat, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ate, and then she said, "I have made some chard and barley for them." So the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Ali, eat from this, for indeed it will be more suitable for you. So this shows that the unripe dates, which are very heating, you know, the Prophet ﷺ asked him to avoid it as it didn't, you know, um, was not conductive to his health. But when the cooling foods like the barley and chard was presented, he asked them to eat. So in this way, we know that, you know, there is proof that the foods as well as the body energetics was also acknowledged and accepted by our Prophet ﷺ. And we can also see this, you know, like during every you know winter uh, when we you know the winter comes in we see that most of us fall sick and we always blame it on the cold but subhanallah this is also because a lot of the times we are not changing our eating habits right in the summer we are eating you know the smoothies and salads and um, you know ice creams and all these fresh fruits but we need to understand that as the fall and winter comes in we need to change our eating habits and inshallah try to incorporate more of the warming food Foods so that they can warm us and give us health, right? So soups and stews, uh, your dried fruits, nuts, these are all warming foods. So we can see that, you know, we, re we see that in our day-to-day -day life, but sometimes we don't realize it. And now you can understand that, yes, this is because we need to also change our eating habits and incorporate foods that are more warming to us. So the next few slides are regarding the um, body type are taken from Nura Sunnah uh, and they, they have an extensive course as well if any of you would like to take it regarding the four body constitutions and how to understand your body type. Mm -hmm. So this is just a quick, a quick guide to your body type. Uh, there is an extensive questionnaire that you can uh, you know go in and um, take a look and you know uh, take the course if you're interested. So take your um, index finger and your thumb and then use it to overlap your wrist. Okay, so if your fingers overlap significantly, it's called you are the melancholic type. Okay, so it goes almost like this because this is the part you know, this is the part where we are usually born with, and we very rarely put on fat on this. So it's very easy to distinguish our body type, no matter how you know which stage of life we are in and how much weight uh, you know we have or have not put. So the next one is choleric. So if your fingers just overlap slightly, just a little bit, that means you are choleric. Okay, and then if your fingers touch exactly, you know, there's no overlap that if they're touching perfectly, then it is sanguine. And if your fingers don't meet at all, there's a significant gap that means it's phlegmatic. Okay, so this is just a, you know, this is a very basic way to find your body type. Like I said, there's, you know, like the questionnaire has a lot more questions <laughs> that you can take a look at. Okay, so inshallah, we'll start talking about the first body type, which is the sanguine. Uh, there is no equivalence of this in the Ayurveda and the traditional Chinese medicine because this body type is considered the natural state or the perfect state. And um, this is... Um, you know, it is hot 
and wet that is it's warm and moist which is what the blood you know uh, and this constitutes the humor of blood and um, this is considered you know the perfect body type um, and it's uh, the traits of a sanguine constitution are you have an oval face you're neither too fat nor too thin you have you have a medium frame and a build you have a you know a normal good appetite you have a moderate balanced metabolism you have a good digestion um, good elimination and you sweat more Moderately. Uh, however, what can happen is if you are not eating according to your body type, uh, you know, and you're eating excessive of fatty foods or sweets, it can definitely lead to an imbalance. And that's when, you know, different conditions may arise. For example, you know, you have a sluggish metabolism, high cholesterol, diabetes, gout, you know, so these can definitely occur if you're not eating according, you know, to uh, in a balanced manner. And uh, definitely just, you know, adjusting your diet again and hijama will help help in excess uh, in alleviating those uh, diseases. So, you know, this since this body type is warm and moist, which is also, coinc uh, you know, um, um, coinciding with summer, uh, sorry, with spring, you can have a lot of, uh, you know, like many of the, the, the regular fruits, the vegetables, dairy, grains, um, you know, most of the herbal teas like rose, fennel, mint are very, um, you know, uh, calming and healing. Um, they have a, like a standard, um, you know, the the regular digestion so the standard American diet can definitely cause a lot of imbalance because it's very high in salt and fat so the foods to avoid would be excessive consumption of meats fatty foods and sweets the next body type is the choleric body type. Uh, this coincides to the yellow bile. So if you have, you know, that is the humor that is, uh, you know, the predominating humor in you, then you would be considered the choleric body type. Now this is the hot and dry uh, body type. And it is one of the most, you know, um, the, uh, the most hottest of all the body types because it's dry and you can, you know, because it's um, off balance, there is no moistness, you definitely want to have, you know, foods that is going to uh, promote that. So the traits of a choleric constitution are you have a broad jaw, a sharp nose, high cheekbones, you have a very ravenous appetite, a fast metabolism. You know, a lot of people, they say, oh, you know, this person eats so much, but they never gain weight. So now you know that this is also influenced by these, uh, you know, the, the temperaments and or your body types, right? We all know someone who eats a lot, but never seems to gain weight. And we know someone who doesn't barely eats anything, but they gain weight so soon, right? So this is, this is because of your body type. Uh, so they also have a very powerful digestion because they have a lot of heat in their body. And um, so, you know, that sometimes what happens is you're not able to absorb all the nutrients and uh, even your, uh, your stool tends to be a little loose and, uh, you know, you might have a lot of deficiencies sometimes. And you also sweat quite profusely. Uh, the following, uh, you know, if your body is out of balance, then you might have fevers because you're already hot. You might have high cholesterol, cardiovascular disorders, high blood pressure, headaches, infections, and anything that, you know, the foods that aggravated are the foods that are already heating in nature. So you, like the, uh, the salty foods, the vinegar, uh, sour or fermented fruit, cheeses, all these kind of aggravate this condition more. So um, inshallah, dietary adjustment will help where you can have more cooling foods and more, you know, uh, the foods that have a lot of water content in them. So zucchinis, cucumbers, lettuce, celery, uh, apples, oranges, all fruits, rice, barley, the chicken and eggs. You'll see that these are all cooling foods and this will help to calm down your body in case there is an imbalance. Um, and also they have, uh, you know, like any herbal teas such as mint, rose, chamomile tea, which is a very calming tea, are also very uh, helpful in this body type. Uh, the next body type is the melancholic. So this is the cold and dry body type. And in this, if you see, uh, this coincides to the Vata in Ayurvedic, and this is the black bile, this, or is called Sauda in Arabic. And this is, again, uh, you know, a body type that can cause, uh, you know, some health uh, 
conditions because it's cold and dry remember we want it to be warm and moist so you can see this is completely opposite to that right so it can you know cause issues so you have to be a little more careful regarding your health regarding your diet now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with this you know body type we cannot say that oh I wish I was born with this I was born with that you know, the, you know we are all you know blessed and tested with various things so if if you have a melancholic body type knowing this and then understanding it and eating according you know the foods can, that can bring it to the warm and moist will help you inshallah so if you know someone who has a melancholic body type, they usually have a rectangular face, very prominent cheekbones, and they tend to be very thin or lean, and they usually have a very poor appetite, right? And uh, they have a very, uh, you know, uh, erratic metabolism, so sometimes they'll be able to eat a lot, and then sometimes they have, you know, GI issues, they have irritable bowel syndrome, uh, they have constipation, they're usually people who have, you know, very uh, high emotions, uh, and they are, have a scanty sweat as well and if you see the most most of their um, you know their conditions are because of the cold and dry nature so they have a poor appetite they have you know they might have anemia um, depression uh, arthritis hypoglycemia so these are these are the problems that do tend to plague them and foods that aggravate it are old dry stale foods beans astringent foods peanuts rancid uh, fats and nightshades so things like this tend to aggravate the condition so you definitely want to have have some warming and some moist foods such as you know steamed foods sauteed foods um, um you know, grains, sourdough bread, soups, too. So these foods will help to bring it back in balance. So subhanAllah, we can see that, you know, there's so many different body types, but if we just tweak our diet a little bit to, um, you know, to make, make sure our body is um, is balanced, we can, you know, uh, do a lot to increase its health, inshallah. And the last one is the phlegmatic constitution. So this is uh, the balgum, you know, the, it, consti uh, it coincides with the phlegm uh, humor, that is the, the body fluid in our body, and it's kind of considered to be the most cold and wet. And um, this uh, body type has a round face, full cheeks, and awful, they have a dimpled chin, uh, they are well developed, they have, uh, you know, a slow, steady appetite, and they are usually have a slower metabolism. So you'll see a lot of people say, I don't eat anything, but you know, they tend to be a little overweight. This is because they have a phlegmatic constitution. Uh, and you know, subhanAllah, when I took this course, I could understand, you know, uh, my children as well. You know, one of them, you know, is a little has a round face and, um, you know, and she actually is the one who doesn't have much of an appetite. And in fact, when she was, you know, a baby and she never used to eat, I used to take her to the, the doctor and I used to be like, you know, I'm a dietitian, but I'm struggling. She's not eating. And they used to tell me that, no, but she looks fine. You know, she's so chubby. And now after knowing this, I can now see that it's because of her constitution that, you know, that's her, the physical frame that she's blessed with. Right. So um, you, you'll see that they actually crave for more carbohydrates and more milk and more dairy products um, for example if I have to get you know like bread or any croissant she can just eat it plain you know and now I understand that okay it's her body type so I have a little more you know uh, I have a more empathy with her because I know that it's not her wanting it but it's her body type so inshallah you know just knowing your body type will help you understand why do you crave certain fruits or why is your body type like this right inshallah and you'll see that a melancholy, a phlegmatic, sorry, that's a typo. A phlegmatic has, you know, more of, uh, you know, the uh, physical conditions that are associated with having a cold and wet body. For example, they may have more, uh, you know, water retention. When you have a cough, they, you, you develop a phlegm very easily. You, you know, you have slow digestion. So uh, you have constipation, you're hypothyroid. You tend to gain weight easily. So, uh, you know, and you get frequent colds as well. So this is because of your body type. And inshallah, if you have more, um, you know, warming and drying foods, it'll help you. For example, yoga good kefir which are um, you know fermented foods the chicken fish organ meats so having soups all this will really help you inshallah so uh, so now we understood that you know this our body 
type can be in four different categories. So just as our body has a temperament and, and our organs, so does the food that we eat, right? So inshallah, we can, we'll briefly just go through the different food categories and you can find a lot of information about this as well. Um, you know, there's a whole book on Amazon that's available um, uh, called, the, you know, the, uh, I think Guide to Chinese, um, you know, foods uh, where you can, there's an extensive list of all the foods and their, uh, you know, properties, whether they're heating, they're cooling, they're warming or they're drying. So, um, and the foods that are cooling and drying, that is the melancholic foods, are pomegranates, ju uh, Indian uh, gooseberry, that is amla, lemons, myrrh, fresh olive oil. All these are, you know, very cooling and drying. So if you actually had to, you know, just close your eyes, you know, and you can actually experiment this as well. And, you know, you take this in your mouth, you'll see that it has a very cooling and a drying effect, right? Your mouth actually feels dry when you eat it. Versus if you actually take warming and drying foods, for example, all seeds and pungent herbs like black pepper, uh, dates, tamarind, garlic, you know, all these are, you know, very warming foods. And naturally, you'll see that these are the foods that you tend to put in your soups as well when you fall sick or you tend to make soups when the winter is coming, right? So these are all very warming foods and drying. So you want to, you know, reduce the phlegm content in your body and warm it up. And uh, for example, even if you have like, you know, just take a teaspoon of ginger juice, right? And just if you eat it, you're your throat is burning, right? And you feel very warm in your body because these are warming foods. And then you have the warming and dampening or moist foods that's sanguine. And this is lamb, goat, chicken, dairy products, like the sheep dairy products, um, the rice, wheat, squashes, fermented vegetables. So these are the uh, warming and the, you know, the moist foods, and these help and replenish our body, as well as the cooling and the dampening foods are the phlegmatic foods, which are the uh, the dairy products, zucchini, cucumbers, melons, lettuce, berries. Um, and finally, now you can see that, you know, earlier when we were small and we had a cold and our mother used to tell, you know, like, don't have milk, it causes phlegm. Uh, you know, my brother, who's a medical doctor, you know, used to say, oh, these are old women, you know, grandmother's tales, you know, that nothing is going to happen. It doesn't matter. But subhanAllah, now, even when you go to the medical doctors and your child has a cold, they'll actually tell you, don't give them too many dairy products because this will increase the phlegm production and cause more mucus and, throw, uh, you know, vomiting, etc. Right. So this is because of the um, constitution of the um, the, the temperaments of the different foods. So if you actually, you know, um, the last time that I had this talk, I actually got all these food ingredients and I, you know, we actually, you know, all of us, we took a bite of all the different foods and we could actually experience the, you know, the different uh, textures and we could experience how our mouth would react to all this. For example, if you take salt, it's just a pinch of it. It actually increases your saliva production, right? But if you take it in a very large quantity, then you'll see that it is uh, dehydrating, right? And that's why you use it as to, you know, preserve food as well. Milk, you'll see that it's cool and damp. Uh, lemon, again, it's cooling and drying. If you just, you know, suck on a lemon, you'll see that you're, you know, you constantly have saliva production because it's drying up your, uh, your mouth. Ginger, like I mentioned, is warming. Watermelon, like I mentioned, is cooling, right? So now let's see what are, you know, most of the foods that the the, the Prophet Sallallahu actually, if you see, they belong to the sanguine category, which is the most balanced of it, right? So we have the lamb, the goat, the chicken, the, uh, the sheep, the dairy uh, products, the grains, squashes, bananas, olives, fermented vegetables. Most of these belong to the sanguine category. So although this is, you know, obviously because he's the most perfect human being you know we uh, you know we can say that you know he would have had a sanguine body type and the foods that he ate as well belong to the sanguine category right so now after listening to all this, you might be confused, right? There's so many different diets that are out there. There's the keto diet, the Atkins, the paleo, uh, you know, and now we just spoke about the body types and then there is the blood types as well. So what should we be eating, right? So it is very simple. In Surah, uh, Surah Baqarah, verse 168, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you people, eat from the earth which is halal and tayyib and follow not the footsteps of shaitan. 
right? And then Surah Muhammad was tells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surely Allah will admit those who believe and do good into gardens under which rivers flow. As for the disbelievers, they enjoy themselves and feed like cattle, but the fire will be their home, right? So subhanAllah, when, you know, there are all these diets, you know, these are the diets that the, you know, the non-believers have, you know, just come up with just because they feel that this might be beneficial to them but you'll see that each of this diet you know removes food groups that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with right for example in the keto diet you're removing all the grains you're removing most of the fruits right and this is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us in the Quran over and over he mentions so many fruits and he says that these are given as a blessing to us that we will be able to eat them in Jannah right we have grapes and bananas Right, so many fruits are mentioned. So who are we in this world to deprive ourselves of this niyama, of this blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Or we have the, you know, the paleo diet or the raw fruit diet, the vegan diet. So we, what we have to understand is that all these are blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every food given is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't deprive yourself and don't, you know, blindly follow, um, you know, these diets that are, you know, people who, who have no guidance or understanding are following right so whenever people ask me i say just follow the sunnah diet that is eat in moderation right so that is uh, something that we first have to understand right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, surah al-baqarah says and do not throw yourselves into destruction so the first thing what we have to understand is don't eat foods that we know are going to be bad for you and what are those foods right those are simply the most processed foods that you'll find are the foods that are bad for you right so you have all these um you know the twinkies and the you know the takis and you know all those foods that uh, you know are so processed that we there's nothing real left in them so you know okay fine you know you're having it you know your child wants it like once in a year once in six months you know our, we are blessed with the body that allah has one of allah has made so beautiful that you know, the liver and the kidney can detox and remove those toxins. But imagine if you're having them day after day, every day, you know, after a point, your body is also going to start you know, complaining, giving up and start going to have, you know, some disease conditions, right? So inshallah, the first thing to understand is to have, you know, the foods which are the most pure and as well as to have it in moderation, right? So subhanAllah, when we are, you know, it's easy when our children, you know, want something to have snacks that are packaged, but, you know, it does take some effort to, you know, research a First of all, you know, if you can cook, that's best. But if not, you know, there are many, many products nowadays that are very, you know, there are healthier alternatives, for example, that are made with, you know, chickpea flour or almond flour, which are much healthier alternatives to the processed foods. So, you know, so just doing a little bit of research and trying to get those foods will also be really helpful. And the next, one of the most important part that, you know, we, at, with age especially, tend to forget is how much to eat, right? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised the believers, you know, with eating and drinking. And he said, the children of Adam fill no container worse than the way in which they fill their stomachs. Let the children of Adam have a few mouthfuls to strengthen the loins. And if possible, then you should have one third for food, one third for drink and one third for air. Right. So we all have, you know, at least once in our lifetime, we have experienced this where we have eaten so much, you know, where we don't realize and we tend to keep eating because the food was so delicious that finally we don't have any space to, you know, drink water. And then when we, you know, we are thirsty and then we drink water, you will realize that you are so uncomfortable that you, you, you find difficulty in breathing. Right. So subhanAllah, you know, no other, you know, religion guides the people to this but we as muslims have been you know we have a beautiful hadith which actually tells us not to you know overeat so one thing when we should remember is that we should eat until we are um, not hungry not until we are full and if you think about it very carefully there's a profound wisdom in it right so until we are full means, you know, we, you know, our stomach is expanded, you know, we go back, we lean back and we say, oh my God, we can't eat anymore. But that is not how we should be eating. How, how much should we eat? We should eat until we are not hungry anymore, right? So we should stop when we feel satisfied, inshallah. And so remember, like, so a few of the points, you know, like the takeaways would be, we re need to eat the one third rule, the sunnah fast, the halal and tayyip food, food that nourishes our body, and is it nourishing your gut? 
balance food from all the food groups, right? So there is no food that you need to avoid or to restrict, it, right? You need, you need to have all foods with moderations and complete nutrition with protein, fats, carbs, vitamins, and minerals. And you also need to eat according to your weather, right? So if you are, like, for example, if you, like, in the place that you are, if it's summer, then eat more you know, foods that are are fresh and moist and more cooling. Whereas if it is um, winter, then have more warming foods, right? But similarly, if you are in different parts of the country, for example, if you are in India or in Pakistan, you'll see that it's a more, you know, like a hot place. So you want to have more cooling foods. Whereas if you are in Canada and it's more cooling, then you would definitely want to have more warming foods, right? And to reduce the red meat consumption. Now, a lot of people always ask, you know, what is the secret to weight loss, right? That is the question that I think I'm, you know, I receive the most. How do I lose weight, right? And how do we eat until we are only one third full, right? The f secret to that is fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no doubt, has, you know, has recommended and prescribed fasting for us as a way to attain taqwa, right? And, and in the Quran, in Surah 21, verse 85, we have been advised to fast so that Allah can increase our taqwa. Right? But at the same time, we, it doesn't mean that acknowledging the health benefits is going to take away from that. Right? Our primary aim is always going to be to gain taqwa, to, you know, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, we also have to understand that it is a form of healing. And outside of Ramadan, we can use it to improve our health. Right? Inshallah. So just some of the benefits of fasting are it reduces diabetes risk because it reduces the, uh, you know, the insulin resistance and helps in reducing the blood sugar levels. And your insulin levels drop significantly, which again then you know, help in uh, you know, preventing the, uh, the insulin resistance, right? And uh, the cravings for sugars. And you could, this causes weight loss. The, the hormone, the, the growth hormone increases, which helps in cellular repair. It helps in detoxification. So think about this. If your car is not working properly, are you going to go take it to the mechanic, you know, and ask them to, you know, repair it while the car is running? No, you need to stop it, right? You need to switch off the engine. It is only then that you can repair it. Similarly, that is how it is with our body. If you're constantly going to keep eating, your body is constantly working to digest the food, absorb the food, assimilate the food, right? Your, your pancreas, your liver, your kidneys, your stomach, you know, your digestive system. Where is the time to repair it? Right, so that is the reason why we need to fast in order for uh, to give our body a break so that we can detoxify. And Subhanallah, we're so blessed that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has not only told us to fast, right, on Monday, Thursday, and the three lunar days, right, the 13, 14, 15, but He's also giving us rewards for fasting. Right, subhanAllah, like what a blessing we have. So not only are we, you know, improving our health, but we're also getting rewarded in process for that, right? So subhanAllah, you know, outside of our Ramadan fast, the first, like the one thing that I would, you know, advise everyone to do is to start fasting your Sunnah fast, right? Whether it is the 13, 14, 15 or the Monday, Thursday fast, try to make this you know, as a routine, and you'll see that your health is improving so much. Obviously, if you have any disease condition like diabetes or any other conditions, you definitely want to talk to your doctor first, right? But slowly you can start doing this, right? Inshallah. And if you see, you know, so if you look at all the number of fasts that we have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recommended, the Dil Hijjah, the Ashura fast, you know, the Monday, Thursday fast, we are actually recommended to, like in a year, it comes up to almost 170 days. SubhanAllah. So that's almost half the year you're asked to fast. Whereas I know a lot of people, like, you know, most of us just want to fast the 30 days of Ramadan and we are depriving our body, uh, you know, of so many health benefits, right? So inshallah, when we start fasting, you'll see that you'll have a lot of other benefits as well. It also reduces the oxidative stress, right? And it reduces, it slows down aging. Uh, they also are, you know, they have a lot of, uh, you know, beneficial changes in several genes that protect you against a lot of autoimmune diseases as well. Uh, it also helps in reducing your cholesterol levels, your LDL, your blood pressure. Uh, it actually increases your brain function. It reduces depression. A lot of us nowadays have seen that there is so much anxiety and mental health, um, you know, diseases, right? So now think about it, right? If you see all these, uh, you know, a lot of people, they're so, like, first of all, you know, there's a lot of 
you know, mental stress, right? But at the same time, you know, a lot of these, you know, psychiatrists or psychologists, how many of them actually talk about what are you eating? Right. A lot of them only talk about your, you know, the life stresses that you have, like, you know, what are the emotional traumas that you're undergoing? But how many of us actually asking them, what are you eating on a day to day basis? There have been, you know, new and you know, your, your uh, research has found that there is so much connection between so many vitamins and minerals to our mood, right? Whether it is vitamin D, whether it is vitamin B12, you know, these are all connected with our, you know, moods, right? The vagus nerve directly connects our brain and our GI system, right? And this has shown to we have a direct connections with our anxiety and our mental stress, right? So when we are talking to people about, uh, you know, mental their mental stress and anxiety, we also need to understand what are they eating? How much are they eating? Are you sleeping well, right? What are you getting your fresh fruits, your fresh vegetables? Are you having your salads? Are you having warming foods? Are you having, you know, all these foods that are nourishing your gut because if you are just going to have your Starbucks coffee and your donut, you're going to have your processed packaged foods, are they giving you all the necessary vitamins and minerals that not only does your body need but your brain needs, right? So inshallah, we need to understand this and one of the most important way is by focusing on our gut flora, right? Subhanallah, we have more bacteria in our body than human cells. Can you even imagine that? <laughs> it's 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 difficult to imagine, right, that we have more bacteria in our body, but that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us. We have almost 39 to 50 trillion bacterial cells in our body. And these are, you know, it, they are responsible for so much, right, for how we digest our food, how we absorb our food, our health and our moods, like I mentioned, right? So when we are talking about our gut flora, we need to make sure we are talking about both prebiotics as well as probiotics. So what, so we've, you know, probiotics, subhanAllah, you know, nowadays there's a lot of talk about it, there's so much awareness about it, but prebiotics are equally important as well. So what are they? They are the plant-based uh, food like that, that, you know, feeds the good bacteria. And these are the mostly the fibrous foods that are not digested by our gut. And they are actually digested by these bacteria. So they help the bacteria to grow, right? So while prebiotics are all of them are fiber based not all fibers are prebiotics certain ones which cannot be digested by a body for example the oats barley mushrooms leeks garlic honey fruits with peels cabbage coconut oil bananas figs olive oil dates cucumbers squashes these are all prebiotic foods and subhanallah we can see how many of these are the sunnah foods right uh, there's so many sunnah foods that are you know like the barley and the cucumbers that are also part of it so not only are you know we going to get benefited in our body, but we can also gain rewards when we make the intention of having this as a sunnah food, right? So for example, barley, right? That is like such a beautiful sunnah food that um, not only, you know, uh, is affecting our health, but also our mental health. Right. Aisha radiallahu anha said that when, you know, it's someone in their, you know, in their community used to pass away or have some sadness, they, you know, she used to make talbina and give it because she heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that have the barley for it wipes away the sadness from the face as it wipes away the dirt right? Uh, from, uh, from your body. So subhanAllah, you know, we like how many of us when we have someone now, you know, who's falling sick, or, you know, is going through some, you know, turmoil or upheaval in their life, how many of us actually take Talbina and go? How many of us actually when someone is suffering from anxiety, you know, they're given Prozac, and they've given all these, you know, medications, how many of us actually tell them, have you tried barley, right? We have such a beautiful sunnah and a hadith the re- saying that you know, this helps our mental health. So inshallah, let us, you know, try to incorporate this as well and try to have more of barley, right, when we are dealing with anxiety. And the next is the probiotic foods. So probiotic foods are those that actually have the bacteria in them and these help to increase the bacteria in our gut, right? So most of the fermented foods like the nabis, the yogurt, kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut, apple cider vinegar, you know, with the mother in it, the cheese, uh, the olives, you know, these are all foods that increase the poop probiotics. I'll talk a little bit more about the nabis as well and inshallah how to make it and the benefits of that, okay? Um, and there are some foods that, you know, which are, can kill this, uh, <clears throat> the, the gut, uh, 
flora in our body. And most of these are, you know, the artificial sweeteners, antibiotics, hormones, steroids, acid blockers, to using too much of antibacterial soaps or hand sanitizers, and a lot of foods that contain too much of, um, you know, the high fructose corn syrup can all destroy our gut flora. So, you know, a lot of people always ask me, you know, can we take artificial sweeteners? You know, we have, we don't want you know, we are not, we are not diabetic. We're not, you know, we don't have any health conditions, but isn't it better to take it instead of sugar? You know, why can't we? That is because these artificial sweeteners, they might not have, you know, like overt or very, you know, uh, explicit health conditions, but they can, you know, internally change our gut flora and this can cause changes in our mood and other ways that we process the food, right? And another thing that what happens, what I've seen is, you know, a lot of people, they, you know, in their chai or in their coffee, they take, you know, like the, instead of sugar, they just have the artificial sweeteners and they feel, oh my God, you know, I'm doing, you know, like amazing, I'm avoiding sugar. And then they'll have like the, you know, like the biscuits and the rusts and all these, you know, like this packaged <laughs> processed foods which have all these hydrogenated fats and so much sugar in them so they feel you know the whole day that you know we i avoided sugar but then you know like you'll see like the rest of the day it has all these foods that have so many other ingredients which you should actually be avoiding sugar if you take the pure sugar just like a teaspoon of pure sugar that's just burnt away by your body right you just go for you know like in an hour it's burnt away but it's all the other ingredients that are there and all the processed foods that are just actually accumulated so that is the reason why you know don't be so focused on you know just avoiding like simple things but be more focused on avoiding like the processed foods with uh, you know excessive ingredients right so what is nabis so nabis is a fermented drink that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to actually have and subhanallah i was not you know like a, a lot of us i think are not aware of it until we actually start studying about it right so it is so simple but it has so many health benefits so you take one or up to any odd number of dates preferably ajwa because we all know the blessings of ajwa dates uh, or take raisins but never mix them again this is because you know they have different uh, you know the temperaments are different so never mix them so you can either take make you know the nabis out of ajwa dates or out of raisins right and you can soak it up to 8 to 12 hours outside or up to three days in the refrigerator and avoid over fermenting because obviously this will then turn into alcohol and then you can drink as is. so for example if you're going to take one date and put it in the night right in a glass of water in the morning you can just drink the water and have the date you can just chew it it does change the texture obviously it gets a little mushy and um if you like it i mean it's fine i you know i don't mind it you get used to it after a point but if you feel that it's become too mushy and you don't want to have it as such you can always cook it into your oats or you can you, know, you can even just like blitz it so when you blitz the nabis like remove the seed of the date uh, and then blitz it it becomes a little frothy and it's actually very delicious and just squeeze some lemon and you know it tastes absolutely delicious um you can definitely try this in ramadan you know a lot of us have you know the sugary drinks the ruhavza right if you actually do this it's actually very delicious if you make the nabis and add a lot of uh, lemon juice and you can have it in the morning or evening so if you soak it in the morning you can have it in the night if you soak it in the night you can have it in the morning inshallah and um, there are a lot of benefits so it is it becomes a slight probiotic obviously it in, uh, improves your gut flora it's a uh, you know it's, it helps in detoxifying it increases an energy it reduces acidity of the stomach so you know one of my aunt during ramadan you know she had used to have severe acidity uh, because of the fasting and when you know when i told her about nabid and when she started doing it her you know her acidity reduced drastically and she was so surprised subhanallah at how much it helped her right so you can definitely re uh, in, uh, use this to re um, reduce your acidity uh, it helps in strengthening uh, memory it it improves the function of spleen, liver, prostate. But if you have any other um, conditions, definitely, you know, you can check with your doctor or your dietitian, inshallah. So as you can see that, you know, healthy eating is, you know, very simple, but it is, it has to be very personalized, right? A lot of people just, you know, tell, oh, what's a good diet, you know, just give us a diet plan. But you can see that, you know, a, a, 
what you eat depends on many different factors, right? It depends on your basic predisposition, on the body types that we just spoke about, on your genetics, on the diseases that you may already have. It depends on the gut flora. It depends on the food that's available around you. It depends on your budget as well, right? So that is an important factor. It depends on the culture that you come from, right? So what we see is that the culture, like the, your genetics, right, what you come from is different and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it like that. So for example, we all look different physically, right? Our faces, our colors, everything looks different. What makes you think that internally we are the same? Right? We are as different internally as we are different externally. So where you come from also really depends on how we should be eating. For example, you know, you might hear, uh, you know, there, there are some success stories with keto diet. I don't say they're not, right? But you'll see that most of this is from North America where the people over here are genetically predisposed to have more protein. So they can do well, their genes are designed that they can absorb and digest more of the proteins and the fats. On the other hand, if, you know, people from, you know, like the Desi, you know, from the South Asia, um, you know, um, countries, they tend to have keto diet, you'll see that the cholesterol increases, they develop other health conditions because we are more, uh, you know, genetically programmed to have more of carbohydrates, right? So the amount of carb and the diet products we have, the people from North America cannot have, right? So regarding, you know, like, again, another question, I just want to mention it here regarding milk, right? We have been hearing so much about milk. It's bad for us, you know, it's like, it's considered white poison now, you know, like they are asking to us to avoid it for children but subhanallah there's a whole verse in quran praising milk right so how can we as muslims fall into that trap right we know that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he has given us this pure fluid but you know between the digested food and blood which is palatable to the drinkers so what we need to understand is that milk is pure but what we are doing to it is what has spoiled us spoiled it right we have taken it and you know first of all processed it you know so much and made it no fat one person fat two person fat so what i always tell people is if you don't have any health conditions any cholesterol problems always use the whole milk right because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it as the complete perfect package form it has a complete right amount of carbs right amount of fat right amount of protein why are you taking away the fat when, when you don't need to right so always try to use the whole milk if you don't have any health conditions right your children now i know that the, uh, you know according to the uh, american guidelines two-year-olds are supposed to be given skim milk right why why are you taking away the fat from the milk and then instead of that giving them chips and cookies right so give them the whole milk this will actually satisfy them more here you have people drinking dipping oreos and eating in milk right which has so much sugar and artificial fat why are you doing that just give them a glass of nice rich thick whole milk and they'll feel much more satisfied right uh, similarly with you know with all your other food products try to have the most unprocessed kind of foods that you can have right whether it is wheat or meat right you try to have like halal and tayyip food so when we t are talking about um, you know meat as well right when we are going to our grocery store ask them how is this meat you know sourced is it tayyib right because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran says halal and tayyib right so it's apart from being at halal, it's also important, it is tayyib. And what does it mean? It means that the animal was, you know, treated in a humane manner, it was not abused. Nowadays, we have so many, you know, uh, instances we know in the documentaries as well that they you know the animals are cramped and they kept you know they're fed antibiotics and they're given hormones and that is not how the animals should be treated right because that eventually trickles down into the meat and the milk and that is then what affects us right so if we are getting the you know the food from halal and tayyib like from humanely treated animals then we won't have all these problems as well right there are a lot of now um, you know the grocery stores online stores that are focusing on organic food organic meat organic milk organic eggs definitely if you know if you are able to then i would definitely say try to purchase those right um and for those of you who say, you know, it's very expensive, well, you know, that is what I meant, right? Our Prophet ﷺ was always a semi-vegetarian, right? There they used to be two months that used to pass before he would eat meat, right? So meat is something that we should be eating on a, you know, in a moderate form, right? We shouldn't be eating it for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, 
right? So we should be eating it moderately. So in this way, when you buy organic food and it's expensive, that is because we need to eat it rarely as well. So inshallah, you know, we use this opportunity to purify intentions. We know Umar, uh, Umar ibn al-Qatab radiallahu anhu who relates that he heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, verily actions are by intentions and for every person is what he intended. So inshallah, if we make the intention that I want to follow the sunnah, I want to, you know, improve my health and eat like how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ate, inshallah, we will be rewarded not only for, you know, for following what the sunnah as well as inshallah in our physical health right and so th the main thing over here is you know it's not important that tomorrow we you know get up and we you know just go clear out everything that is bad follow it for the next um you know like the next one month you know we're excited and then we say oh this is too overwhelming you know and you know we slowly slip back into the old habits right so start doing small things consistently and build it up as a lifestyle habit and inshallah it will be more easier to sustain right the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said take up good deeds only as much as you're able for the best deeds are those done regularly even if they are few right so inshallah try to you know take up deeds that are most easy consistent and start doing it and one by one you can add inshallah more and more um deeds right so inshallah i pray that we all eat according to you know our sunnah according to you know the, how our prophet has guided us and how we are guided in the quran inshallah subhanakallah wa bihamdika ashhadan la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa Jazakallah khair, mashallah, beautiful uh, presentation. Thank you for bringing the, the two words together, the sunnah and the, the modern day the, the dietitian. Uh, so uh, we have about 30 minutes before Zohar prayer, and um, we have some questions coming in online. Uh, those that are watching online, the deck is there as well. Uh, so if you want to, um, there's a lot of information here. So if you want to process this later and uh, look at Sister Ilham's deck, the deck is in the video description and those that are in person. Uh, so go ahead and put your uh, questions in the chat box, inshallah, and we'll uh, have Sister Ilham look at it. First, we'll take questions from uh, the room. Uh, so I'll take the mic around and we'll just raise your hand and I'll come over to you, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. It was very fruitful discussion, Alhamdulillah. Your, your presentation. Uh, I have a question. You haven't mentioned about uh, about hijama uh, uh, cupping. Uh, can you say? Can you shed some light on that? Yes, yeah. inshallah. So. Um Definitely, I didn't, uh, you know, like uh, Brother Munir said, there's a lot of information, so I didn't want to overwhelm. So, uh, you know, we kept focused on the body types. But hijama, you know, subhanAllah, is also a way of the Islamic uh, treatment, right? Uh, and unfortunately, that is a way that has been, uh, you know, again, put in the... I would say in the back burner, uh, a lot of people don't realize the health benefits of it. And, uh, you know, we kind of only look at it, you know, if you have any muscular problems or something like that. But subhanAllah, there's a lot of benefit to hijama, right? I mean, this is because there, uh, you know, the two types of hijama, right? There's the dry cupping and the wet cupping. And subhanAllah, uh, we can do it, you know, the hijama based on what our ailment is. The first thing I would say is always when you do hijama, go to a Muslim practitioner, right? Because hijama is not something that is like a physical healing, but it's also a spiritual healing. So we need to make sure that they are, you know, Muslim and they can also, you know, recite the ruqya and, you know, the, uh, the, the surahs that should be recited. So inshallah, try to go to a Muslim practitioner. Uh, the second thing is also, you know, uh, try to go for ailments that you don't think even, you know, need it. For example, a lot of people, you know, like I mentioned, go only for muscular, you know, ailments, but you can go for it for anything, right? For, uh, you know, for headaches, for migraines, for diabetes, you know, uh, for cancer as well, for skin conditions, you know, so this is really helpful. We know from the hadith that uh, our Prophet wasallam used cupping when he had migraines and he always recommended to his sahaba as well. So inshallah, you know, this is one of the modality of Islamic medicine and, you know, it's important that we definitely go back back to it and we try to you know get more familiar and more um, you know more regular with it inshallah yeah. all right we'll take some online questions then uh, so the first one is how did the prophet know his uh, blood type and his uh, temperament type 
So like I mentioned, uh, we have no knowledge about the Prophet ﷺ blood type. And uh, I did not mention, you know, the blood type diet over here simply because I personally don't, uh, you know, believe in that uh, because I haven't seen any benefit or anything like that. Uh, you know, if, if it benefits you, like I mentioned, we all are very different. And if it benefits you, please go ahead. But I personally have not found any benefit or any scientific evidence supporting that. Um, and regarding the body type, um, like I mentioned, because our Prophet وسلم, you know, is the perfect human being the perfect example and because the sanguine the body type is the perfectly balanced we uh, can you know assume that he was sanguine but we don't say that he was sanguine with any certain you know with authority or with you know as a statement we don't do that yeah another question is uh so what's the preference on whether mothers should try raw organic milk or pasteurized organic full fat full fat milk so definitely if you have access to raw milk, that is the best. You know, we all grew up drinking raw uh, organic milk and we, uh, you know, that is the best milk. But I understand, you know, we have to be practical as well, right? I mean, I wish we had a cow <laughs> that we could all just milk and we could have that, you know, obviously nothing like that. But we also, we have to be practical in this day and age. Uh, you know, we are here in the U.S. and we have so many responsibilities. It's not easy. Uh, raw milk does get bad in three to four days. So if you are able to purchase raw milk, raw organic milk, and, you know, consume it within that time frame, that's perfect. But on the other hand, if you cannot, then I would say the next best alternative would be organic pasteurized milk. Um, recently, uh, you know, from a few years, uh, the Costco carries A2 milk as well, which is, again, an amazing option. Uh, so just to briefly tell you about the difference between A2 and the regular milk, uh, most of the cows initially used to be the A2 cows, and this was the protein that was very easily digested in our body but then they found that the cows that had the a1 type of protein uh you know they gave more milk so they started you know obviously going towards more of the a1 milk just because it was more easily available and in larger quantities uh but then you know we are supposed to have a balance of a1 and a2 with a pre predominantly more a2 uh, protein um so this was again rediscovered and you know this was brought back and a lot of people i've seen that who have actually lactose intolerance are actually intolerant to the a1 protein so they found that when they shifted to a2 milk they were able to digest it better they they had less of the bloating less cramps uh, less acne problems and things like that so um you can definitely have the a2 organic pasteurized milk as well inshallah all right, we have another question coming in online about, um, can, this is not directly related to nutrition, but can you comment a little bit about uh, some of the non-Muslim practices that are kind of the modalities these days, uh, yoga, Reiki, um, how can that, this help us as Muslims practicing in America? So um, yoga, obviously, you know, we can take it as a form of exercise. Um, you definitely, you know, um, don't want to <laughs> chant, you know, the Om and uh, everything. But, you know, if you're taking it as a form of exercise, then definitely there's nothing wrong in that. You just have to make sure, uh, you know, the person uh, that you're going for yoga is, uh, you know, is not doing it in terms like, you know, it's not including anything that would bother on shirk whether it's like you know like the sun salutations and you know with the intention that this is you're doing it for the sun or you're doing it for a religious purpose if they're doing it purely as a means of exercise uh then you know it's uh acceptable but again always you can always like it, uh, check it with your local scholar inshallah uh, but you know definitely you want to focus on exercise we all know again that you know in islam as well we are you know encouraged to be physically fit to do exercise um you know so whatever way you want to incorporate that inshallah and you know even if it's yoga like you want to take away anything that is you know uh, not islamic and just you know focus more on the stretches it's fine but again you want to check which yoga instructor you're going and with your local scholar as well. And as far as Reiki goes, um, there is nothing regarding that in Sunnah. Um, I know that, you know, it's they use the crystals, the body energy. Honestly, I have no, you know, information regarding that. And um, again, it really depends on who's doing it and what their intentions are. So... <laughs> All right. I think uh, that's that's coming up. I really appreciate hearing about how, uh, you know, it takes time for 
modern science to catch up with the sunnah. And so when we, we talk about intermittent fasting, I think pretty soon here there was a, pretty recently there was a article in one of the medical journals about how after the child comes through the birth canal, having something sweet uh, helps with brain damage. Yes. You probably had that in your deck there. But yeah. th that's something that now is coming up. So it's going to take time for uh, um, um, you know, medicine to catch up with our sunnah and intermittent fasting and uh, you know, not eating to your full all these things. Yeah, actually, um, you know, had it at the point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, I wanted to mention that the first probiotic food that we have is actually the technique, right? Uh, subhanAllah, after a child is born, what are we recommended to do, which is a sunnah, right? We are, we are supposed to chew on a date and then we are supposed to take you know, the saliva, which has the sweet particles and put it on the baby's mouth. And that actually is not only does it, you know, stimulate the baby to start the sucking process, which obviously, you know, the baby will do, inshallah. Uh, but that is actually one of the first form of the probiotic as well, right? So um, when uh, the, we have a normal delivery, like that is also a way that the baby is exposed to the probiotics, right? To the gut flora from the, from the mother's body. But then we also have this way where a father can be part of the you know the baby's gut flora right so subhanallah this is a way that you know we that the probiotic foods are mentioned in the sunnah we have the nabis as well uh you know we have the olives so this is like the probiotics are a big part of our diet and our health as well inshallah and like you mentioned you know, like when we were small, right, a lot of y'all must have experienced this. When we would be fasting, people would be shocked, like not even water, right? That was what we would all be asked, not even water, right? We, we It was something shocking. And now then this whole, uh, you know, awareness came about the health benefits of intermittent fasting. But what I want to mention is that, you know, when we have been given the sunnah and the knowledge and the wisdom by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the benefits of our fasting, we should be doing that, right? So because the intermittent fasting, um, we know that when the uh, you know a, a sahaba radiallahu came and asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what how do fast what how, what is the best way he said you know the best of the fast is the fast of the Dawood alayhi salam, which is every alternate day, right? That is like the uh, like the maximum that we can fast. Otherwise, we can fast the Monday, Thursday, and you know, 13, 14, 15. But when you see when you do the intermittent fasting, you see that you know these fasts are there for years or months or days, right? And that is not how we should be fasting. We shouldn't be depriving of our body of food for, you know, like 18, 20 hours for days on end, right? Like, uh, and this also like completely messes, messes up our circadian rhythm, right? Like you are, they say that they're fasting, but you see that they stop eating at, you know, six or seven, and then they start eating again at six or seven in the morning, which is, technically not fasting or if they you know go on fasting till four they still keep drinking water green tea black tea and coffee and things like that but as you can see, like what i mentioned is when you want to detoxify and you repair your body you don't want to keep putting in things because your body then is still secreting the enzymes and the hormones and it's still doing the digestion if you want the maximum benefits of fasting it is by the sunnah way of fasting that is which is then again called as dry fasting in modern science and they have found that this is what actually gives you the most benefit the dry fasting where you completely refrain from food and water for you know certain hours inshallah more, more and more questions coming in online uh, sister may Allah reward you for sharing uh, such useful information can you share anything with us about a connection between nutritional deficiencies and eating disorders and addictions so um, we know, that, you know, uh, the condition called pica obviously is very common. We know that, you know, if someone has a deficiency of um, iron, you know, they tend to eat mud and sand and, you know, they even like, you know, uh, take, you know, scrape the walls and eat the paint. Uh, they have ice chips. So we know that there there is definitely a connection between food deficiencies and, uh, you know, any disorders. Uh, that is an area that has actually, uh, you know, undergoing a lot of research now. Uh, you have Dr. Omar from, Dr., uh, from Harvard University, who also talks about the connection between brain and food, because we see that a lot of vitamins actually are, you know, they're deficient in people who 
come with bipolar disorders and schizophrenia and any other, like I mentioned, and anxiety. So you definitely, um, you know, when uh, vitamin D, for example, was just initially uh, connected only to bone health, but then they found that there was a huge connection with depression. People who were deficient in vitamin D actually have depression as well. So similarly, you know, vitamin B12 has also been, um, you know, um, uh, indicated in a lot of cases with depression and anxiety. So th definitely there is a connection between this. So you, you, if you have any, uh, you know, mental disorders, you definitely want to go get, you know, your blood test taken and, uh, you know, you definitely want to take a look at that. As far as eating disorders concerned, it's, it's a very complicated uh, area, uh, you know, anorexia or, you know, bulimia, they definitely have you know, both aspects where they have like a mental aspect to it, where they have like a very, you know, difficult and complicated relationship with food leading to a lot of, you know, like food deprivation, which leads to, you know, uh, deficiencies, and then that kind of just messes it up. So there is no, um, you know, confirmed studies that this deficiency causes this, um, you know, so, so and so mental disorders, but that is because this field is very recent and new. So inshallah, you know, that is a thing with nutrition, right? It's always changing. So there is a lot of information that is coming up. Uh, so we definitely want to keep abreast of that. And uh, inshallah, I hope that, you know, I can come back here and talk about the connection between mental health and food. Uh, I have spoken to Dr. Rania as well earlier on that. Um, and inshallah, you know, um, we can have a complete presentation on the connection between that as well, inshallah. We look forward to that presentation, inshallah. So uh, questions keep coming in online. Um, we have a, another question about the, can you speak about the impact um, on account of availability of fruits and foods from various countries, not per our local weather conditions that are available throughout the year? That is a very good question. Um, you know, I think in this day and age when there are so many imported foods, uh, we don't understand which food is growing in which season, right? And we all struggle with that. Uh, for example, you know, like berries or, or even watermelon is typically a summer food because that is when you're supposed to be eating it, right? Uh, we need that cool, the coolness and the nourishment and the, the, the moistness there you know, of these foods in summer. But then you see that these foods are available throughout the year in winter. And that is why you'll see that, like I mentioned before, you'll fall, you know, people tend to fall sick because they don't change their eating habits. So it is our duty, to be honest, that we take a look at, you know, the growing seasons and change our foods accordingly. So if watermelon is available in December, it doesn't mean that we actually buy it, right? We should know that this is not a food that we should be consuming in winter. And inshallah, we, you know, we can gravitate more towards um, the foods that come then. For example, persimmons, like I mentioned, they, they are a drying food, right? So those are perfect. Apples, they are available in fall. Why? Because again, those are drying foods. So we, if we understand what foods grow in which season and, you know, shopping in farmer's market is honestly one of the best ways of actually being aware of this because they actually give foods that are only available and grown locally, right? It's only when you go to Costco and Safeway that you'll have foods all the time. So going to farmer's markets is a really good way of understanding what foods are available at that season and eating accordingly. And, uh, and also we have like dried fruits and nuts, you know, th those again, the, uh, the, the food temperament changes when you dry the fruits. They, they no longer become moist, but they become drying. So that is why you have a lot of like, you know, dried fruits, etc. that you can have during the um, winter. You know, you can have like, you can put this in your milk, right? And have like, you know, like the hot, hot drinks, etc. So you definitely, you need to change what you eat and even though these may be available in the supermarket doing our own research is important to understand which foods fruits and vegetables to eat in which season thank you so this is a kind of long question but i'll try to summarize it here um she's asking with factory farming and even with pets that are getting depression medication at homes um can you speak to the effect of not eating halal or day and the effect it has with having depressed animals and that then being them being slaughtered in ways that are not dayab and then the effect that has on our bodies uh, as a result. Uh, definitely. I mean, this is, like I mentioned, a very, very important factor when we are choosing halal and tayyib, right? That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom, wisdom, right? I mean, he, whatever word is 
mentioned in the Quran, every single word is mentioned with his divine guidance. So if he had wished, he could have just said, eat the halal foods. But why did he mention halal and tayyib? That is because how an animal is raised is definitely has a lot of effect on us. So when an animal is stressed out, right, the cortisol levels increases in the animals. And this is then present in the meat and the blood and, you know, the, the milk and everything in the body, right? And then when we eat this, this in turn affects us, right? So this definitely has an effect on us. And that is the reason why we need to make sure that the animal is also tayyib. So how do we do this? First is by, make, by asking the grocery stores, right? So if you never ask your local, you know, your butcher market or you know where you buy meat is this you know how is this animal grown what they will know what they will say okay i'm giving you halal food people are buying it quietly so why should i also make any effort because growing an animal in a tayyib way is more expensive right you are giving them more space you're giving them more like fresh food for example um modern you know unfortunately the modern farming they they did not have this connection so what did they do they started saying okay the cows are there why do we take them to the grass and why do we need to feed them it's fine you know we'll just give them whatever food they want because at the end of the day we're just slaughtering their meat so they started giving them you know all the genetically modified foods and corn and soy and then they went one step further and they started giving them these um, you know the feed that is made up of other dead animals other like the roadkill other you know the dead parts of the animals they started doing all that and they said we don't care because at the end of the day you know we're just eating the meat and that is when the you know the diseases like the mad cow disease started coming up right because this the the microbes from this uh dead animals that they were eating when were going into the cows and then were passed on to the humans as well so this was like a very very clear um example of how what they eat was affecting us so that is why then they stopped doing that then they started giving them uh antibiotics and hormones because they said we just want more milk and we don't want them to fall sick they would cut their beaks right so that they don't peck each other and this caused so much pain to them that the cortisol levels would shoot up and then again you know we would have like the sick and the diseased chickens right so it is our duty as a muslim that we find out was this animal injured what where their beaks removed where the claws cut off where they you know where they tied up where you know you have um these chickens that are you know in such cramped areas that they are not able to move. So a chicken usually, you know, typically takes around four months, three to four months to grow. But nowadays, the modern practices, you can have a chicken within like, you know, a fully grown chicken in 60 days, right? So you need to, you know, make sure that where you're getting from, you need to ask them. So if you ask your butchers, your grocery store that I want Thayya food, they will make sure that they ask their source from where they're getting from that, oh, like, where are you getting it from? Is this halal? Is this Thayya? And, um, um, you know, like I mentioned, yes, you may have to pay more for that, but then that is how we are also advised to eat, right? We know from our sunnah that red, we are asked to reduce our red meat consumption. We know that the Prophet وسلم, ate more of, you know, like the vegetarian food, right? So if we know this, we'll understand, you know, when we were like, you know, during the olden times when they used to actually cut their own chicken, right? They would take one chicken and they would cut it and then they would use every part of it, like or one cow or one sheep, right? And they would use every part of it for days. But what do we do now? We have like kima roti for breakfast and then we have like, you know, like a chicken fry for lunch and then we have like, you know, uh, like, you know, like Nihari or something for dinner. Can you imagine how many animals we have just slaughtered, right? Like, so when we think of it in just in terms of pounds, we don't realize it. But when you think in terms of animals, you'll realize how many we are eating. So in that way, inshallah, once we slow down on that, everything else, you know, will follow inshallah. We look forward to having you more at MCC because uh, you've really struck a nerve here. Uh, here. Mashallah, a lot of people are thinking. I think uh, we're pushing against Zohar here. So we'll make this our last question. Okay. Uh, this is from a young person. I want to go vegan or vegetarian so badly, but my parents won't let me because they think that I'm leaving Islam or committing a huge sin. Um, how can I convince them? Because I've learned now that there were Sahaba that were vegetarian. And um, is that okay? Uh, so I personally, from whatever I have studied, uh, I have 
not heard of Sahaba who are vegetarian, like, I mean, always, we all are lifelong students. I'll definitely, uh, you know, do, do more research and I'll see if that is the case, inshallah. But from what I know, um, there, you know, we, we like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ate meat, eggs, uh, you know, he had, uh, you know, uh, milk, obviously, it's, uh, you know, like I mentioned, it's in the Quran. So, um, the reason why we are not, you know, like I wouldn't advise any Muslim to go vegan is because you don't want to deprive yourself of a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, right? Why do, you, why do you want to deprive yourself, right? So, like I mentioned, if you're answer is because I don't want to like harm the animals then we also have to understand that we all are created for a purpose everything in this life is created for a purpose and the purpose of the animals is to give us food right and that's not I'm not talking about it in like a joking you know sarcastic manner but that is the purpose of the food Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in various verses of the Quran that we have given you the animals to be slaughtered right and to be eaten so that is their purpose so them being slaughtered is not something that we are need to be made to be guilty about. So that is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second is again, when milk is praised in the Quran, who are we to refrain from that, right? Even in Jannah, Allah says that I will bless you with the rivers of milk and honey. So it is not something that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to refrain from, right? We are, that is a blessing we are given. So why are you, you know, depriving yourself of that blessing, right? So if, Try to have it in the most pure form, like I mentioned, halal and tayyib, but don't deprive yourself of those blessings. Um, third is, if you want for health reason, a lot of people, in fact, there are many Facebook groups and Instagram, uh, even uh, you know influencers who actually talk about how they went vegan and then they faced a lot of problems, a lot of uh, deficiencies uh, to the point where it affected even their mental health and then they actually came back and started eating meat. So when you go vegan, you are depriving yourself of, first of all, an enormous amount of protein. So that is what I would like actually take this opportunity to mention, right? So when people... Uh, say that they don't want um, milk and then they start having soy milk and almond milk and pea milk and so many <laughs> oat milk and so many different types of milk, right? But then you see that this milk, how is it being produced, right? So if you actually research it, no other milk is as perfect as cow milk. Every milk is deficient. If you make, for example, almond milk at home, you ha you're getting the protein because you're not you know, uh, removing the almond, uh, but then you don't, you're barely getting any calcium or you're barely getting any vitamin D, which is so important for your bones. On the other hand, if you go ahead and you drink almond milk, the store-bought ones, it is, it has barely one gram of protein. So how are you going to get your protein? You need at least one gram of protein per kg body weight. So if you, for example, weigh around 65 kgs, you need 65 grams of protein. And if you are getting one gram of protein from your almond milk, from where are you getting the rest of your protein, right? Then you go on to having more of soy. And we all know that anything in excess is bad. So you have a lot of controversy about soy, that it has the phytoestrogens and it affects your hormones. Because obviously, if you're going to eat it excess of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to, it is going to start affecting your body. So where are you getting so much? much of um, protein then you go towards your pulses and then they have lectins as well small amount of lectins no problem your body you know can process it but if you're going to have like two cups of beans or peas because you want your protein content obviously the lectin then will start accumulating in your body so you'll see that this all starts kind of building up and by just trying to you know deprive yourself of one of the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you are you know your body is so um imbalance and then you have all these health conditions and then you try to do you know get more and more complicated and you know i just feel it you're going down a rabbit hole so uh, you know and another thing i want to say is when you are following any health advice from a person who's living you don't know at the end of the day how they died right you when a person right now might say i'm having a raw food diet i feel great 10 years later, they might say, you know what, I actually made a mistake. We did have a recent influencer who then changed and started incorporating more cooked food into the diet because they said, yes, my body was not able to digest it. So always try to, you know, like as a non-Muslim, you know, the advice is on, you know, the medic modern nutrition to take your advice from persons who have already died just because you, you want to make sure, you know, you know the end result. But we as Muslims, we don't need to like get confused by the chatter. We take our, you know, we take our advice from the best 
uh, example that we have, that is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if it was, he had milk, then you can have milk. If you don't want cow's milk, because it was not as common during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, definitely you can go towards goat milk, sheep milk, which is what he had. So you can tweak your diet, but uh, I would say don't deprive yourself of any blessings. MashaAllah. JazakAllah khair. MashaAllah. That was a beautiful marrying of practical and spiritual advice in your presentation and your Q&A. So may Allah bless you. We look forward to having you more at MCC Salam here. JazakAllah khair. Everybody for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon inshallah. JazakAllah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.